Britain's glorious landscape has been carved by its story. Our land is rich with magnificent monuments that echo thousands of years of struggle, success, conflict and innovation. When you consider just how much more impressive the defences would have been 2,000 years ago. They tell us huge amounts about the people who once lived here, but they also present us with some intriguing mysteries. Look at that beautiful! I'm Bethany Hughes. I've always loved our nation's story, and in this series we'll be using exciting new technology to better understand our fabulous heritage. I'll be joined by aerial archaeologist Ben Robinson. This looks like a serious military purpose. His high-tech kit will provide our eye in the sky, because looking down from above, you get a completely new perspective on these hauntingly beautiful sites. You've never seen a site no, like that no, before? No, never. Brilliant. And it's these breathtaking pictures that will reveal Britain's secrets from the sky. This quiet, unassuming field in Suffolk hides a story of royalty and treasure. It's called Sutton Hoo, a headland overlooking the River Deben in East Anglia, and it's the home of a truly spectacular cemetery. These eerie, enigmatic grass-covered mounds are the last resting place for a dynasty of Anglo-Saxon warriors our very own Valley of the Kings. At its heart, a magnificent ship burial full of gold, jewellery and finely crafted weaponry. And yet its secrets lay hidden for 1,300 years. So why and how did something so rich, so majestic, remain lost for so long? This really is like an archaeologist's dream, isn't it, this place? Yeah, the treasure, of course, but it's not about treasure for treasure's sake. It's about what the objects tell us about society and kings at that time. From the ground, Sutton Hoo can simply seem like a bit of a mishmash of different sized lumps and bumps. But once Ben gets the octocopter into the air, his bird's eye view reveals they're part of a complex ancient landscape. Yeah, I'm just getting the first impression of the site now, and he's not, he's not very high, but already I can see there's a cluster of stone-filled shapes about the size of graves, and there's suspicious long straight lines cutting through the site. But all around are these mounds, which show up really nicely. It's the mounds that dominate the field, and as Ben can see from the air, the skyline overlooking the river. And these are, these are barrows, they're burial mounds. And the idea is that you put a body in the centre in a pit or, or some sort of uh, vessel and then mound the soil up on top. These are not everyday burial monuments, not by any stretch of the imagination. These were reserved for really important people. Normally, if I was looking at a site like this, a sort of barrow cemetery, I'd be thinking maybe this is prehistoric and there's lots of these in the Bronze Age, about 4,000 years ago. But these are something even more special. These are Anglo-Saxon burial mounds, incredibly rare. The amazing thing is that we only know they're Anglo-Saxon burial mounds because of the remarkable vision of one extraordinary woman. Edith Pretty was a wealthy widow who in the 1930s owned this land and her home, Sutton Hoo House, overlooked these grassy mounds. The story goes that Edith had a spiritualist friend to stay, and one night she had a strange dream. She saw a ghostly warrior on horseback riding over the great mound. There was just one in a long line of tales that Edith had heard about this place, and that, combined with the intrigue of a golden brooch turned up by a farmer while he was ploughing, meant that Edith decided she had to act. In 1938, Edith engaged the services of a local archaeologist, Basil Brown. For a year, every burial mound he investigated turned out to have been robbed long ago. And then, in the summer of 1939, and on the eve of the Second World War, 
he hit the jackpot. What Basil Brown found right here under this mound was truly bizarre. The remains of a splendid 1,400-year-old ship. And the discoveries didn't stop there. In the middle of the ship, there was a collapsed burial chamber of a great warrior king. Surrounded by gold and silver, by exquisite jewelry and fearsome weaponry. Nothing quite like this had ever been discovered before in Britain. The wooden structure of the 90-foot-long ship had completely disintegrated, as had the body of the king. But the iron rivets that held the vessel together survived, leaving a ghostly impression of the boat imprinted in the sand. Incredibly, this treasure trove had remained untouched for over 1,300 years. I mean, it is slightly bizarre, though, isn't it? Because we do have all this treasure here, and the Vikings come after the Anglo-Saxons, and the Vikings are very keen on their gold and their silver, not averse to a bit of looting. So it's odd, in a way, that the treasure stayed in the mounds. Yes, but they could be a bit squeamish about digging into burial sites. And also, maybe they just thought it was another prehistoric burial mound. They dug into one or two, got disappointed, so simply didn't bother. We have a lot to thank Edith Pretty for. It was her curiosity about the mounds in her back garden that led us to discover the last resting place of an Anglo-Saxon king. When the Sutton Hill burial was discovered in 1939, a public hearing ruled that if it had obviously been left in the ground in order to be dug up again at a later date, then it would belong to the crown. But because the treasure had so clearly been consigned to the earth for great ritual purpose, it was the property of the landowner, Edith Pretty, and she could do whatever she wanted with it. And very lucky for us, she decided to give it to the nation. And almost all of the Sutton Hoo treasure is held here in London at the British Museum. Its crowning glory is this stunning ceremonial helmet. It is just so... Beautiful. Absolutely. I mean, it's the most amazing thing. And whoever this man was, he must have made quite an impression exactly. with a helmet like that. Absolutely, yes. It's one of only four complete surviving Anglo-Saxon helmets, so it's incredibly rare as well. There is, there is an interesting little uh, secret, though, of this mask, isn't there? It's beautifully done. I mean, it couldn't be more exquisitely done. And then down underneath, somebody like it as a last-minute thought has punched into nose holes. That's right, yes. Yeah. So it's very interesting, though, because it tells us that this helmet was made to be worn. And we also, when the helmet was discovered, there was uh, the remains of a leather lining inside, so it was made to be worn and worn comfortably. The thing is, we feel as though we know him. But we actually don't know who this man was, do we? That's right, yes. The coins that were in the burial give us a rough date of between the 610s to 630s. And later text that we have gives us some contenders that may have died during that period. The main contender is a 7th century East Anglian king named Radwald. Every item laid alongside him tells us something about how he lived. The lavish Mediterranean silverware beautifully carved drinking horns, gold and garnet dress accessories, and even the remnants of a stringed musical instrument called a lyre that the museum's now recreated. All statements of one man's achievements, a man with international connections and a love of music. And the biggest statement of his power and influence is the ship burial itself. From the air, Ben can see that, even now, it's clearly left its mark on the landscape. You just see this gouge in the top of the mound. That's where the great ship burial was. And in fact, it's picked out also, the base of this great ship shape is uh, it's a slightly greener grass there. You can tell there's something different going on. And actually, when you're looking from above, it's amazing to think how a 90-foot boat got up here, because it must have come from the river. And it's only when you look from the banks of the river that you realise the steepness of the slope up to the mounds. So it arrived down this river, but it had to be hauled up, up that hill, 
to the burial site, which must have been quite a task. Yeah, the, the hill is about 100 feet high from where we're standing and about 500 yards in, in distance. He's the king. He can command as many burly warriors and muscle men as he likes. The solid oak boat would have weighed at least 10 tonnes. Dragging it over the land was a last physical act of devotion from his loyal subjects, no doubt with a little help from some slaves. So here we are, mound one, so they've dragged the ship right up there. Every part of this process would have been carried out with love, care and attention to detail. Ben and Angus are now standing where the ship's burial chamber would have been positioned. It was here that it was filled with all the king's worldly goods. And then, in a final act of dedication, earth was piled on top of the boat, creating a huge burial mound. And just like this reconstructed one, it would have stood proud on the landscape for all to see. So you can see what a prominent site this is. You don't get much of an impression of that now from up here because it's surrounded by trees. But imagine the trees weren't there and this site would be clearly visible from the river. Whether you were a local or a visiting foreigner, coming up river here, the burial mounds would have dominated the horizon. There would have been like a kind of visual explosion in the landscape. The men who were buried here were so influential. They were saying basically, we controlled you and your world during our lives, and now, even in death, you cannot escape us. The ship was buried in just one of 17 mounds on this hilltop. But how could this highly visible royal cemetery keep its secrets hidden for over 1,300 years? The clues are there. You just need to take to the sky to make them fall into place. This is Sutton Hoo, the burial ground of a number of powerful Anglo-Saxon kings of East Anglia. We've taken to the sky to try to find out why the secrets of this Valley of the Kings were lost for centuries. That chapter in Sutton Hoo's history was edited out for a thousand years or so, people seem to have completely forgotten that this was a royal cemetery hiding a 90-foot boat and priceless treasures, despite these mounds still being in plain sight. Ben sent up his octocopter to see if the landscape will reveal its secrets. There we go, it's heading off, so we should start to get the... Ah, oh, there we go, yeah. And it would seem that this royal cemetery hasn't always been treated with reverence, even after the treasures of the ship burial were discovered. Look at those two trenches stretching right through the site. Now, you could think they were ancient ditches of some kind, but because they cut through the site, they must have come later than the burial mounds. They look really quite recent to me. These were trenches dug, presumably by mechanical excavators. Yeah, if you look, you can see this blobs where the excavators dump the heaps of soil as it's worked its way across. These are anti-glider trenches. They were dug in World War II, just months after Basil Brown unearthed the buried ship. And the, the whole idea here was just to create trenches that would make it very difficult for the German gliders and airborne forces to land on this flat plateau. Yes, I mean, we're, we're only looking at one tiny bit, but the whole of this area was covered in these things. They've been ploughed away everywhere else. So this was a very tempting target for the Germans, who were just across the water at this time in the early 40s. But there are also hints of something much older here that's got Ben intrigued. Now, these piles of stones here, they're not ancient. Um, they're obviously modern. They've been placed there, but presumably they're marking out other graves. And that's really interesting because, of course, the point is that there are loads of burials here that weren't burials in mounds. This cluster of graves, right in the centre of the site, was discovered during an archaeological dig in the 1980s. It's evidence that just a few hundred years after this was a revered burial ground, its use had crucially changed. Wow, 
That's much more gruesome than I thought it was going to be. This is a replica of what is known as a sand body. The actual bones have dissolved in the acidic, sandy soil, but have left a kind of mould or impression in the sand. This actually is an execution victim. Almost definitely he was hung. You can see the leg there. Yeah. This is an arm. Obviously, that's the head. 39 of these sand bodies were found, which suggests that just 200 years after the royal burials, Sutton Hoo had become a place where common criminals were brought to be executed by hanging. The fact is, we know these gallows were placed in prominent positions to be seen. Well, it's a sort of warning that if you it misbehave, is a warning. this is what would happen the to you. The people hung uh, from a gallows is very much a warning. Yeah. So it seems this prominent and mysterious headland witnessed a spectacular fall from grace. Ben's got the octocopter back up in the air, and there's something about the burial mounds that's caught his eye. I can see dimples on top of some of these mounds in the foreground here, and in fact on quite a lot of them. Now, that someone's been digging into the tops of these. Somebody saw these burial mounds and thought they were worth raiding, but somehow the great ship burial still survived. In the early 1600s, there was a trend for hunting out gold and plundering ancient sites. Ben's aerial view reveals why this treasure may just have been missed. The end of the burial mound isn't there. It was probably ploughed away through centuries of farming. So sometime around 1600, somebody comes to Sutton Hoo and starts digging into all these mounds, knowing that there's treasure in them. But luckily for us, they missed the treasure in this one, and that's because this end of the mound has been taken off, so they think the centre of the mound is here, and they know because they've dug in the other graves that the treasure's in the centre, so they sink their shaft here. And by a matter of feet, they missed the greatest prize they could have hoped for, this, this great burial chamber right here. I mean, it's just luck after luck after luck, and it took that amount of luck for it to be preserved long enough for someone to find it last century and properly excavate it. The looters probably didn't realise just how important a site this was, or nothing would have survived. It seems that the fine detail of the stories of the kings who were buried here failed to make it through the generations. Why? Well, a clue was that musical instrument, the lyre that was found among the treasure. Because this ship was buried at a time when history was passed on, not in written word, but in poetry and song. I suppose, in a way, Sutton Hoo's always going to keep us guessing because there is no formal written history from the period. But even though we don't have that, it was a, still a place full of stories and actually histories at the time, wasn't it? Oh, essentially, the, the, the great medium of poetry would have been uh, telling us all about it if it had survived. Uh, even the king who lay in state in that great ship burial, surrounded by that magnificent treasure, uh, had his own personal musical instrument. And this is a replica of that, a replica of the royal lyre of Sutton Hoo. So he himself was a poet. Uh, the essential accompaniment to the lines would have been this sort of musical instrument. When it says, Men of Kunan, Sejan to Suna, Saladadende. Sadly, no songs or poems from the East Anglian kings survived. But we can make an educated guess at some of the wonders they may have told, thanks to an epic poem called Beowulf, which Sam's now reciting. Do you think that any of the lines of Beowulf specifically relate to what was going on here at Sutton Hoo? Oh, very much so. The opening movement culminates with a wonderful account of a royal ship funeral, which is the great poetic account that brings to life the bare bones of the archaeology here. We have Beowulf's burial, which culminates the great epic, over, uh, citing a, a mound deliberately intended to be visible from the waters. You shouldn't underestimate the power of those words, because even if they aren't giving you pure, hard historical fact, they're not just fantasies. Most of Sutton Hoo's near misses seem to be about the fact it had been forgotten. 
mainly because the Anglo-Saxons just used music and poetry to record their history. And maybe that's a good thing, because it meant that this treasure survived. It remained intact until one landowner's intuition and one archaeologist's great skill unearthed these wonders in our very own Valley of the Kings. It's a funny old thing, the passage of time, isn't it? Because you get this man who had absolute power in his day and age, and then he's forgotten, or at least his memory is neglected, and it takes archaeologists to bring him back to life but again. But that's what archaeology aims to do, give us our history back. The secrets of Sutton Hoo, lost for centuries, have been painstakingly pieced back together again by passionate amateurs and world-class experts. And that is work that still continues today. It makes you wonder how much of our untold history is still out there. Not lost. Just not yet found. Even though this is a small island, there are still mysteries waiting to be uncovered from beneath this earth. Can Peter really say goodbye to Simon? It's going to be emotional in Coronation Street back in just a moment here on ITV. Then at nine, Maddox continues to fight for her life in Lewis. <laughs>